So Linda Maxson, she's going to lead off uh, with a testimonial, and then we'll move into the other ones. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Well, thank you, Senator Ort and panel. And thank you for validating everything I have to say, everything I'm li living through. Thank you all for coming, especially my friends and family. My name is Linda Maxson. I live in the town of Orangeville in the county of Wyoming, state of New York. The name of the wind project is the Stony Creek Wind Farm. Later, it was changed to the Orangeville Wind Farm. It's operated by Invenergy LLC from Chicago, Illinois. The total number of the wind turbines was to be 59, but after the Beaver Dam was discovered to be a house, they had to remove one. They say that the megawatts is 88.5, but I've seen three different numbers, so I can't validate either. However, it's up to 38,000 homes will be uh, receive in energy from these turbines. That's if they run at capacity. And if you're a turbine holder, you know that they seldom run at capacity, if ever. The one we have in Orangeville is the GE 1.6 that was untested at the time. The one previously mentioned by Gary in Sheldon was the GE 1.5. The height is 450 feet. The hub is 80 millimeters. The project went into effect December 31st, 2013. My house is surrounded by industrial wind turbines. Every single window I look out, I see a turbine. Minimally one. 1,230 feet is the, the, the law in my town for a non-participating person. That's us. 700 feet from the property line. So it's one quarter mile is what they're allowed to be. The symptoms of stress, tension, that began when the town presented the project. It only increased with each town board meeting, planning board meeting, and zoning board meeting. And through living through the clear cutting of the land, the displacement of every living thing on that land, followed by the cement trucks, the rebar trucks, hundreds of vehicles carrying the various components made our quality of air poor. The breathing became difficult. We were unable to open our windows on the roadside because of the dirt, the grime, the dust was in the air. With the installation of the turbines, there was the insistent beep, beep, beep and sounds of riveting and the night lights for night work that disturbed our sleep and any daytime outdoor activities. Our further sleep disturbance has continued day and night. The daytime disturbances are noise that sounds like a train, Niagara Falls, or jets landing and taking off constantly. Sometimes the turbines are so loud, we have to talk loud in order to hear each other when we're outside. Flicker is nauseating. Flicker is caused when the blade crosses the path of the sun, and for a moment it's dark, and then it's light. Just open and close your eyes. Flicker makes me feel sick. I have to leave the room where flicker is occurring, and the only place I can find relief is in my bathroom, as long as I don't look out a window, because flicker also covers the ground, the trees, and anything that's out there. Just like the noise, there is no escaping flicker when it happens, and it lasts for about a half hour. The loss of Vista and our declined property values was almost instantaneous. It began when we realized that we had no view left. We live in the country. We live 1,800 feet above sea level, and we expect to see the beauty of the land. The leaves popping out in the spring, and now with the leaves changing. The migrating birds, we've lost it all. The headaches and continued stress and, stress and tension from the noise in the vista showing only turbines running day and night and lights 
blinking red lights. It doesn't end. The radio and television are also negatively affected. Muggy, damp days make the noise worse, as does the speed of the wind and the direction of the wind. And then there are days when the turbines just roar and for no apparent reason, they just roar. The only good day or night is when they're not running. And we will say to each other, we can feel the tension leaving our bodies as well as the sense of calm and quietness. And we know for a moment that all is well. The relief we get is when we leave the house. Earplugs and wearing my CPAP machine help me at night. However, my husband, he hears them all the time. I have many solar lights and various shapes and styles in my front lawn and my backyard so I don't see these things, so I don't have to look up. I don't see the red lights, I don't see the blades turning. And at night, I have the solar lights. In the daytime, I have the lawn ornaments. Pick one, I've got it probably. The turbine negative effect is wearing on us. When we leave for pleasure, we don't want to return. We feel good, and when we crest a hill and see the lights, we immediately can feel our bodies tense and our stress level increase. The medical treatment we've sought, we've been to audiologist, and we both have some hearing loss. My husband has AFib, and the cardiologist will tell you that stress and tension has a negative effect on an individual. I have an intestinal bowel disease, and the tension and stress wrecks havoc with my body. The only others in Orangeville that are impacted and can speak up have either moved away or are looking to move. In the very beginning, I contacted the developer. And the response from the person, the representative, was the mitigation for flicker is blinds, shades, curtains, shutters. I have nothing on my windows because I live 1,800 feet above sea level. My nearest neighbor is a quarter mile away. And I don't care what the deer see. <laughs> the mitigation is $200 to buy these things. So if I went out and I purchased them, they would give me a 1099 and I'd still have to claim it on my income tax. The same as a for TV reception. They'll give you a one year package of the basic package for a satellite, but you have to claim it on your income tax as income. And the mitigation for sound is earplugs. If a person chooses to take an Envenergy's offer, they will also have to sign a release telling, that states that they, for 40 years, four zero years, cannot speak ill of Invenergy. However, if that participating person decides that they can't take it anymore and they begin to speak up, they lose the money that they are being paid to have that turbine on their property. It's not going to change. The turbine's going to remain there, but they just won't be paid. You have to appreciate that the noise can be heard in my house, even with the doors and windows closed. And there have been times when my house has actually vibrated. I'm going to read this. The turbines are on the Linden Clarendon fault line. The Clarendon Linden fault line is a major series of fault lines in western New York, extending through Orleans, Genesee, Wyoming, and Allegheny counties and is responsible for much of the seismic activity in the region. So how much is each turbine, weight of each turbine putting the stress on this fault line? We have 58 in Orangeville. Uh, Sheldon has 77 something. So how much weight is on this fault line? Every Orangeville resident has a well. With the leaking of fluids and the many dismantling of the turbine blades and hubs, what's going into our water aquifer. The turbines sometimes move and sometimes they don't. Too much wind and they shut down. Too little wind and they can't run. But daily they run regardless of wind and shut down and seem to rest. And then they'll start up again. They must produce, however, enough electricity to keep the red lights blinking and that keeps the FAA happy. They are controlled in Chicago which is the headquarters. 
and with cameras on each one, the turbines can be stopped or started as they desire. I want to know what's blowing in the wind, meaning we have no air quality control devices in the town to tell us what the turbines are stirring up and what we're breathing. The turbines have been dismantled, we're leaking fluid, you can see it running down, or the gaskets on the blades have flapped and flapped to where there's black marks all over them. We need, we get little more, we, we, we learn nothing from the company, they won't tell us. So I want to know what's blowing in the wind, and I want to know what's going in my well. In the beginning, I contacted the Wyoming County Health Department, the Wyoming County ADA, all the permit issuing agencies and others, and the only results silence. Did you know that the residents in the Delaware Water Gap are actually taxed a view tax? Well, in Orangeville, I want a refund. I have no view. Clearly, my husband and I are suffering from industrial wind turbine syndrome. The lack of quality of life from sleep deprivation due to noise, our health being compromised, the decline of our property value, and the loss of our vista has taken a toll on our quality of life. The questions I have, how much per kilowatt hour does it cost? If a turbine produces so much energy that it can power so many houses, what's the cost per kilowatt? What is the return on the taxpayer's investment? Because we know we're all paying for it. And is it worth ruining people's health and life? I thank you for being here and for listening. And I really sincerely thank you for put, doing this and validating what we know. <clears throat> thank you, Linda. <coughs> Excuse me. Next up is uh, Lynn Bedford. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to share my personal testimony on the devastating effects wind turbines have had on me. First, let me clarify something. A person with an experience is never at the mercy of a person with an opinion. I have a bachelor's degree in theology and I'm an ordained minister. I live in a once quiet, pristine Arkwright Hills in Fredonia, New York, site of the first industrial wind turbine complex. I am surrounded by seven 500-foot turbines, with the closest one being 1,400 feet, yes, feet, from my once bedroom. On September 8, 2018, it began. Within 24 hours, my ears began to ring. They have never stopped. The first few weeks were full of questions as, why are my sleep habits changing? Why am I an emotional roller coaster? I started to question my neighbors, and they were all very upset about these turbines. I started to do an in depth research on the health effects on human beings. I came to a sad realization that I had become a victim of an uncontrollable circumstance. The global consensus was the same. Wind turbines closer than a mile and a half setback is hazardous to one's health. I began to lose my balance. I became sick to my stomach. I started losing vision in one eye. My hearing became greatly impaired. My heart would pound like it was pounding right out of my chest at times. But the sleep deprivation has been about the worst. Some days I feel like I'm about to lose my mind. I will call a neighbor and we will just go in our basement and cry together. The more I search, the more I understand. My human body is being attacked by something called infrasound, and it's cumulative. Infrasound is considered to be a weapon of war 
States, the United States Army. The Arkwright Summit Wind Project is producing infrasound. This to me has been a form of torture. It's immoral, debilitating, and unethical. Torture means to inflict suffering. I have endured so many forms of suffering this past year due to these turbines. This is actually a crime against humanity. Something must be done about it. Go globally, people are sick. At the hands of people who care more about money than human health and well-being. I pray someone will put an end to this wind turbine nightmare before people start dying. I believe there is much better ways to achieve zero emission by 2050, but at the cost of drastic quality of life decline is a legacy I cannot leave my 29 grandchildren and five great-grandchildren. Thank you for listening. And uh, I believe here on behalf of Sherry Simmons and John Yancey is Rebecca Sheldon. Thank you, Senator Ort, and thank you to the panel for presenting the information that you did. Um, I think if John and Sherry were here, uh, I know they wish they could be here because the information you presented um, explains a lot about their situations. Okay, thank you, sorry. Um, my name is Rebecca Sheldon. I'm here today to share the stories of two individuals who could not be here in person, John Yancey and Sherry Simmons. As fellow residents of the Tug Hill in Lewis County, New York, they live about four miles from the Sheldon family farm in opposite directions. Like the Sheldons, their family roots grow deep here. Through the course of many conversations, I have come to know the details of their experiences with wind turbines and how they have, impact, have been impacted. What I share with you now has been prepared at their request and under their supervision. John lives on the edge of Maple Ridge, one of New York's oldest and largest wind projects. His view to the south and west is dominated by at least 50 of the nearly 400 foot tall turbines the closest 1,300 feet from his front door. 2,500 feet from his back door stands another turbine. Several more are within a mile. These turbines are responsible for the noise that have compromised his peace and quiet for the past 13 years. At times, he tells me, they can be as loud as a freight train. He can hear them over the running engine of a school bus parked in his driveway. During the winter when there is ice on the blades, the noise is horrific. Even when it is not windy enough to produce electricity, the turbines still spin, waiting for wind. They constantly gear up and down, which is accompanied by a sound like that of a jet engine. I was just at John's house this morning and I heard that firsthand, the gearing up and down, and it was a quiet morning there. and. It's a jet engine right next to his house. Though John sleeps with a white noise machine by his bed, it isn't until he travels away from home that he realizes how much better he can sleep. For John, the noise of the turbines is not just a sound, but also a sensation. He has told me that he doesn't need to look out the window to see if the wind stopped blowing. He can just feel it in his body. And when the wind does stop blowing, it startles him to remember just how quiet it used to be. As John has explained to me, turbines don't just add a new sound to the environment, they drown out enjoyable natural sounds one would expect to hear in a rural setting, such as leaves rustling in the breeze or the croaking of frogs. And that is not all they have taken from John. His sunsets have been altered by shadow flicker, especially in the spring and fall. All the windows on one whole side of his house are kept closed, blinds drawn, in order to block the disturbing distortions of light and sound. They have contributed to a family rift when his father signed a lease to host turbines. 
John's anger and frustration at the situation played a role in the decline of his first marriage. They have turned the farm of his youth into an industrial park. In his view, they have replaced community values with corporate greed that have pitted neighbor against neighbor. John has contacted the developer many times. Once there was an actual mechanical issue that was contributing to higher than normal sound levels and that was repaired after six months. But overall, nothing has changed in 13 years. A sound study was conducted from his property, though he has never seen or heard about the results. As one of the few people on Maple Ridge who did not sign a lease or a good neighbor agreement, John has spoken out publicly against industrial wind, attending town board meetings and hearings to warn residents that wind energy isn't everything it's cracked up to be. Sherry Simmons' story began much more recently with the construction of Copenhagen Wind in 2018. As the Simmons family became aware of this proposed project, they refused to participate, denying the developer, EDP, the rights to cross their 100-acre farm with transmission lines. When EDP could not assure them that there were no safety risks, they turned down money to allow the turbines closer to their property. Despite their proactive measures, when the project was constructed, the Simmons had 13 500-foot turbines within close view of their farm, two of them only a few hundred feet from their property line. The closest turbine was 2,500 feet from Sherry's home and 1,700 feet from her son's. When it came online in December of 2018, it was soon apparent that they were much too close and much too loud. Sherry describes the noise as the sound of a diesel truck sitting in your driveway, calling it unbearable at times, with the nighttime hours being the worst, making it very difficult to sleep. Even when the wind isn't blowing, the turbines rotate to try and find the wind, making a whining sound. After a series of frustrating and dead-end phone calls to the developer, Sherry began attending town board meetings to seek remedies. Finally, with the town involved, EDP promised to conduct a sound study, though it has not yet been performed or even scheduled. They acknowledge that there is a noise problem, but precious little has been done to correct it. Sherry has pointed out to me that the problem is not just the closest turbine. It is the whole project. Many of her neighbors have complained of similar noise issues the sound of a jet engine in their living rooms, whooshing sounds louder than the television, but they don't know what they can, they don't know what they can do, so they don't do anything. One woman keeps a daily log of what the turbines are doing around her property. She walks the roads and takes note, takes note after note of the sounds they are making and what they're doing. In the meantime, while Sherry waits for her sound study, she has been put on antidepressants to help with her PTSD, which is the result of a horrific car accident. It had been under control for years, but has recently worsened. She has a very strong startle reflex. Um, she was rear-ended by a dump truck and was almost died. Um, so she startles very easily. She's also always listening to background noise, as if trying to hear the truck coming towards her. Um, she is at times anxious and overwhelmed, and I don't think she necessarily connects that to the PTSD. It's just a feeling that's always with her. At other times, she feels confused and forgetful. She's taking sleep aids, as has her son and his family, including their two children, ages nine and 11. Anxiety has been a problem for the entire family. They cannot enjoy the land that has been a part of their family for four generations. The quiet solitude that soothed Sherry's PTSD symptoms is gone. The cabin that they built on a remote part of the property is so impacted by shadow flicker and noise that it's not the relaxing getaway it was intended to be. When I asked her if she would ever move, she said, no, I will never move from here. My husband was born in the house we live in and also died here and is now buried here. This home is our life. We have worked hard to have this. Why should a windmill chase me away? I will fight them to regain what we had until I die. 
John and Sherry hope that sharing their stories sheds some light on the true impacts of wind turbines. For those living closest to them, the consequences extend beyond that of just a bothersome sound. Turbines can become a destructive and invasive presence which can come at any hour without warning and with no way to make it cease. It goes where peace and silence are needed and expected and deserved, taking with it many aspects of human well-being. Thank you for listening. I would like to thank all of those who gave uh, personal testimony. You know, it takes a lot of courage to get up here and stand up here in front of all of you and to share a very personal story. Um, you know, Mike and I and maybe some other, we stand up here and talk all the time, but for most people, uh, you know, speaking in front of a, a room like this is, is intimidating enough. Um, and yet when you're sharing something very personal, it's also very intimidating. So. I want to thank them for, for being here because I think those testimonies are important as a takeaway for everyone who's here tonight. Um, and I'll just conclude with this. You know, regardless of where we are in sort of the, the larger energy debate, the impacts that you heard personally and the, 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 the data and the metrics that you heard from the panel of experts up here those are real. Regardless of where you are, you can't discount the impacts because everything has an impact. Good or bad, everything has an impact on real people. And in my experience, I represent a largely rural district. And increasingly I find that the price of a lot of policies uh, are felt or are foisted upon rural communities and usually poor rural communities. And I don't believe that's an accident for one second. I believe that's a big part of at least what drives me to have this conversation and what a lot of other people here in this room might feel is that very often you matter less or though it would seem or your concerns sometimes seem to matter less than your fellow New Yorkers or fellow New Yorkers in different suburban communities or in more affluent areas. Um, I always say you don't see any of these windmills popping up in Spalding Lake. You don't see them, you know, popping up uh, in Midtown Manhattan or in Westchester County. You see them going to areas that are rural and, and, and certainly not affluent. And, and there's a lot of factors for that, but I do believe that goes to a large part of people who are here who've lived it, live in these communities and feel that those communities are changing in their character and they're also having obviously a negative impact on their own mental health as well as physical health. And these are real impacts that we need to discuss because of the energy goals and the policies currently in New York State. We're going to see more proposed projects like this, not less. And regardless of where anyone is, that's a fact. You could be against them, you could be for them, but the current goals of, of, of New York State uh, and of this administration are going to drive more of these proposed projects. And so whether you, whether you live near one of these projects today or not, at some point, this is going to affect a lot of people.